new changes in the works when it comes to how America deals with hostages and paying ransom. According to reports, the Obama administration will no longer bar hostages' families from negotiating with captors or stop them from privately making ransom payments. Joining us now, former director of both the National Security Agency and Central Intelligence, General Michael Hayden. He joins us from Newsmax, Washington. Mike, again, thanks for your time here on Newsmax Prime. Thanks, J.D. What do you make of this new policy? J.D., it's really a hard question. If I look at this from a policy perspective, I, I think the answer is very clear. If I look at this from a human perspective, I think the answer is very clear. The problem is, J.D., they aren't the same answer. And in, in reality, I think what the president's trying to do is split the difference. I'm, I'm not going to automatically criticize that. I would strongly recommend we keep an eye out for what now happens in terms of how often Americans are taken hostage under this new policy. J.D., in a sense, when you allow a family to pay ransom for a hostage, you are, in a sense, transferring risk from your family member to future family members. In other words, you may be making it more likely that other people's children or father or mother or sister are captured and held for ransom because you've suddenly made it more profitable for those who would do this. So the Again, suspicion it's is... a hard question. I don't want to judge harshly, J.D., but we need to check to see what this new approach actually does in terms of the likelihood that Americans are held hostage for ransom. And the suspicion is, sounds like, that this may encourage more kidnappings abroad, correct? J.D., that was always the rationale for the policy that apparently was changed today, that if we begin to give in on the specific cases, overall, we will make the situation worse for Americans abroad. Uh, General, let's move along to the fight against ISIS. ISIS releasing a new training video today featuring children as soldiers. By showing these kids training to be warriors, ISIS says to the world, they'll, they're here for the long haul, a generational change. Will this propaganda work or will it backfire on ISIS? Well, first of all, J.D., I think your premise is right. This is a generation-plus issue, as far as I'm concerned, and that doesn't necessarily mean that my Air Force is going to be bombing and strafing in that region for the next 20 to 30 years. But I really do believe this is going to take more than a generation to work out. So in that sense, the, the ISIS video is almost symbolic of the kind of problem that we're facing. It, it also suggests something, something else that we also have to kind of take to heart, J.D., and that's about the nature of the enemy we're facing. I used to say when we were fighting al-Qaeda, here was an enemy that rejects the very premise of the Geneva Convention. And that premise is the distinction between combatant and non-combatant. They rejected it for their victims, and they even rejected it for themselves, saying that all true believers are combatants in this cause. I think we're seeing an extension of that philosophy in this video today. Obviously, it's repulsive to people like you and me, J.D., but you know, people can do some very terrible things when they think what it is they're doing is the will of God. And I fear that's what we're seeing here. A general, in the minute and a half that remains, um, it's worth noting that uh, the U.S. plans to send arms, aircraft, and troops to six European nations in an effort to stop Russian aggression. Uh, what does this all mean for our relationship with Russia? Well, J.D., I think it's long overdue, and, and to put a precise point on what you just described, what we're pushing forward in Europe is pre-positioned equipment that our troops can then fall in on if there's ever an emergency there. Uh, I think it's a good move. I think it's prudent tactically. I think it's prudent strategically in that it, it, it messages the Russians that we're serious about defending NATO territory. Necessary step, J.D., but not sufficient. There are other tools of statecraft we need to bring to bear on the Russians so that they understand what it is they're doing now is not a profitable course of action. 
A Lieutenant General Stephen Wilson, the commander of the U.S. Global Airstrike Command, has compared Putin's behavior toward the Ukraine to that of Nazi Germany in the 30s with the rest of Europe. In the 30 seconds that remain, Mike, do you agree with that? I wouldn't go so far, J.D., but there, that there is a similarity. Hitler wanted to protect, thought he had the duty and the right to protect Germans wherever they lived, Sudetenland or elsewhere. Putin seems to think the same thing about Russians. So in that sense, we have a parallelism here, but I think there are lots of, really lots of differences, too. Historical parallels, Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. Perhaps we're seeing that now. Mike, there is so much going on, we're going to ask you to stay beyond the break to talk specifically about Iran. You heard what Mike had to say on these hot spots. We'll have more with the general right after this timeout. Stay with us. According to CCTV News, the Iranian parliament has voted overwhelmingly to ban nuclear inspections as part of any future deal with the United States and other world powers. As we welcome you back to Newsmax Prime, the Iranian government also refused to let the U.S. interview 23 key military and nuclear experts as part of any final deal, calling the move, quote, an attempt at spying. So with a deadline for an agreement one week away, where do we stand? Let's continue the conversation with the former director of both the CIA and the NSA, General Michael Hayden. Mike, uh, before we get to that, earlier today, the supreme leader of Iran accused the U.S. of trying to destroy the Iranian nuclear program altogether. Knowing the mindset of Iran, is this chest thumping or something more? Well, I suspect it's a bit of chest thumping. Uh, one can hope, J.D., perhaps hoping against hope, that that's chest thumping prior to the Supreme Leader making the kinds of concessions I think are necessary before we actually have a workable nuclear agreement. By the way, I, I don't oppose the destruction of the Iranian nuclear program because I do think it's a threat to us, to Israel, and to the region, but that's not American policy. Well, Mike, at that same session of Parliament we mentioned, it also is reported that several lawmakers in attendance chanted death to America. That doesn't exactly sound like a group of people willing to work on a deal to achieve peace, does it? No, no, it doesn't. And, and we've seen a lot of recurrence of that recently, J.D. I suppose as the adult in the room, uh, we kind of have to swallow hard sometimes let them say that for their domestic consumption and concentrate on the specifics of the deal and make the deal what it is we need it to be. That's more what, what I am worried about. Bottom line, Mike, with all these key issues still looming, will that deal be made by next week? No, it, it won't, J.D. It's going to continue into July. Uh, we may get a deal a matter of weeks perhaps a month or so after the deadline. But, but, J.D., I'm really concerned about what seem to be American concessions. About 10 days ago, Secretary of State Kerry said that we really didn't need to know about possible military dimensions of the historic Iranian program because, and I'm quoting now, we have absolute knowledge of what it is they did before. J.D., I'm telling you, there isn't an American intelligence officer alive who would agree with that statement. That kind of stuff makes me worried. And on that worrisome note, you have our thanks, General Michael Hayden. Now, it is time to hear what's on your mind with your comments via social media. We start with Gerald, who emailed in about the controversy surrounding the Confederate flag in South Carolina. Gerald writes, the Confederate flag does not stand for hate as many people are trying to brainwash the nation to believing that this flag does. It's sad people are believing a flag is the cause of that horrible crime when, as one black pastor said, it is not the flag, but it is a demonic spirit that caused this young man to go haywire. I say to that pastor, amen, and I wish those in media would do the same. Thanks very much, Gerald. The next comment comes from Michael, who's upset after hearing our interview with Jay Delancey from the Voter Integrity Project last night. You may recall Jay talked about Hillary Clinton and about North Carolina gutting voter ID laws. He writes, J.D., Hillary was partially correct. She said no American citizen should be denied the right to vote. 
of course, they should have to prove their citizenship. Otherwise, we'd have the citizens of other countries voting in our elections. Let's face the truth. Illegal aliens are citizens of foreign nations. They are not Americans. And obviously, they should not be voting. Thanks very much, Michael. Finally, we hear from Gail, who talked about a certain Newsmax TV host and a certain program she enjoys very much. Gail writes, <clears throat> I like J.D. Hayworth and hope he will be on more than just his one-hour program, Newsmax Prime. I liked it when he had his three-hour program. J.D. does great interviews. Thank you, J.D. and Newsmax. Gail, thank you. I'm... Uh, I'm blushing a bit. And to cover up that blushing, here's how you get in touch with us. You can do it via email, Facebook, and Twitter. And probably the best place is NewsmaxTV.com slash comments. That'll do it for tonight. Stay brave, stay free, stay tuned.